thank you for inviting me here to talk. Thank you for turning up in such good numbers, especially as it's so very windy outside. Um, as uh, Zoo was saying, we've, uh, I've retired since last we talked, so I'm no longer uh, directly associated with ARM, but I still have a lot of ARM history, and inevitably the things I'm going to talk about are in this domain. And what I'm talking about here today is they're not making atoms any smaller. Now, when, when I retired, uh, one of the things that happens is you start to look back on your life and you realize what you've been doing, and sometimes you see it in a d quite different way uh, from when you're busy working. On a daily basis, you're doing your job. And so this is somewhat a retrospect, and it's going to start from the fact that um, I noticed that this year actually coincides with the 70th anniversary of the invention of the transistor. Now, of course, we know that the transistor is a fundamental part of everything that we do around us and the electronics in our product, in our pockets and the electronics in our cars and in our TVs and all, the, all of that other area. And this was the first transistor. It doesn't look much like we think of a transistor today. But essentially, it was just this guy, Schottky, Shockley, who had the idea that maybe he could modulate a current flow, a large current flow, with a control electrode at the bottom. And I've shown it really as this kind of symbol, which it never really caught on. The symbol that, that caught on was these at the bottom here, um, which are, uh, if you like, they're abstract descriptions of the transistor. And if you look at the uh, illustration there of the first commercial transistor, which happened just four years after the concept was in the research labs, then you can see that the architecture of a delivered transistor, the implementation of a delivered transistor, doesn't look much like the original concept. Now, it was, as it happens, 60 years since the invention of the planar transistor. Now, the planar transistor this doesn't really look very much to you, and this guy called Her Herney, um, created this as a, uh, an implementation of the transistor, so it's still a transistor. And the novelty of this one was all of the connections are on the top surface. Now the attraction of having things on the top surface co really comes about when uh, Jack Kilby made the first integrated circuit. Because all of the connections are on the top circuit, then on the top of the circuit, then you can start to think in terms of creating a real circuit. Now his first implementation, you'll notice, has actually got two pieces of silicon uh, because he, didn't, he wasn't quite clever enough to work out how to put it on one chip. But it wasn't many years, in fact just three years later, that the first thing that you could recognize as an integrated circuit came about. And this was created by Robert Noyce, who founded Fairchild Semiconductors to do this and it was the first, it's interesting to note that the first integrated circuit here was actually a digital circuit because this is also a, a kind of fundamental turning point as well because the, the concept which hadn't really been realized at that point was that digital architecture was a much more scalable uh, approach which is applicable to implementations and so it turned out to be a dominant architecture in the things that follow, in the years that have followed. Of course, people were making, or subsequent to this, did make analog integrated circuits, and they did make circuits which were bipolar and some which were CMOS. But if they were essentially digital, again, we were, we were looking at an architecture, which is the digital circuit, and an implementation, which was bipolar or CMOS, or the particular layout technology or its geometry and so on. So we were separating architecture and implementation. Now digital as it happens turns out to be a very good uh, method for state machines and memory. Now of course we all know what memory is today, it's, we're used to having it everywhere, it's in our cameras, it's in our um, phones, we all have memory. Now memory of course is, is not actually any use to you without a context and digital context gives it significance. If you have a memory chip and you can't put it in something which understands that memory chip, then it's useless to you. So it's important that these things are seen together. Now it's only in 1965 that Gordon Moore, um, who I'm sure you've heard of in terms of Moore's law, uh, created this concept and he created it in an article that he wrote 
in uh, Electronics Magazine and basically he was saying that uh, he could see that by 1975 we might actually have as many as 65,000 transistors on, a, on an integrated circuit and he was basing his observation on the designs that he was making in Fairchild with his team and he was designing at about the 80 transistor, 80 component level that time, 1965 and he was basing his observation on circuits that he'd been designing in recent years of 30 to 40 component level. Now, what does a circuit look like at that, I at that era? So when Gordon Moore thought of this idea, what was he designing like? Well, that's what an 80 component, 30, sorry, a 30 to 40 component circuit would look like. Um, it's four two input NAND gates. Now, most people would consider that as a trivial amount of electronics, but you still can buy the 74 series logic chips in the, uh, in the digital catalogues. They're still useful for some purposes. But that's the sort of level of complexity that he was talking about in 1965. And oh, incidentally, that was the EDA tools that he was using, pen and paper, and the slide rule if you needed to calculate anything, like timing. These were the tools available in that era. I'm going to slightly deviate a little bit because I want to, set, uh, I want to emphasize the difference and the importance between architecture and implementation. Now, this is a radio receiver, and it's a block diagram. It's an architectural description of what goes on in a heterodyne receiver. So at the top left there, there's an antenna which is picking up uh, radio waves from the air, and uh, there is a, an RF amplifier down at the bottom there is a local oscillator which is providing a sine wave, the, the sine wave is mixed in a multiplier and then the resultant uh, signal is amplified and detected or discriminated, uh, amplified and put out onto a loudspeaker at the bottom end. Now that's a description that most people who know something about radio will recognize. The interesting thing about that is that's an implementation from 1945. So electronics didn't start with the transistor, you might have missed that, it actually started with the valve. But this circuit is doing exactly that function that was described by, uh, in the architecture of the digital radio that, was, uh, the radio that I was talking about. And so there's a transistor version of the same thing. And you can see there is an antenna down the left hand side, it looks like a coil, looks like a uh, uh, coil. Then you've got transistors which are doing both the oscillation and the mixing and through to an audio output stage at the other end. So the implementation is different. The architecture is the same. And of course today that's what it would look like. Just a chip. You don't really know what goes on inside but essentially you've still got the antenna at the left hand side and you've still got the audio out at the right hand side. They're still analog but in the middle we don't know how it's done. We only know that it is done, and we do know, and you can deduce it from the outside, that it's using a heterodyne receiver technology. So the implementation is still the same as the architecture. So separating those two is important, because when we get into uh, digital design, then actually to realize that when we're designing something, we're not designing it for a specific technology. We're designing it to be implemented on a technology as a separate thing. So, 1970 now, moved on quite a bit. So five years after Gordon Moore with his law, this is the sort of level of digital integrated circuit that was being produced. This is a, um, an, uh, an MSI, a medium scale integration. It has 300 transistors on it and it was a chip full. So that's 75 gates, 300 transistors. Now it's interesting at that point because the description over here is an architectural description. You don't see the transistors anymore. Inside each one of those gates is a logic implementation using transistors. So hence you get at the top there that little parallel, 300 transistors, 75 gates. If you're using um, CMOS logic, then that multiplication factor is about right. If you're using bipolar, then it's wrong, it's about uh, five, tran five transistors per gate. So the, the implementation has separated from the architecture of this description. So this architecture here is for a, a bit slice 4-bit ALU. 
Now, most of you will have some idea about what an ALU is, an arith arithmetic logic unit. And it does the sort of functions which are described up there at the top, AND, OR, XOR, etc. And <clears throat> the interesting thing about this one is it was designed as a 4-bit slice ALU, which essentially means you could take that chip and you could put two of them side by side to make an 8-bit ALU, or four of them side by side to make a 16-bit ALU. Now, it was designed to be expandable, which means that they thought we could integrate that on the next generation and put it in one chip, but they'd anticipated that. Now, of course, an ALU is not a computer on its own. It's only a part of a computer, so there was going to be chips outside and around it to make it into something which is... Um, which is useful in the context of being a computer, but nevertheless the ALU is one of the central parts of it. Now that enabled people to design the ALU and to think in terms of separating the design from the implementation. So by 1991, 20 years or 19 years further on in time, ARM had this idea. And ARM had the idea of taking a CPU that it had the RISC C CPU at the top, the block diagrams of course are an architectural description of the thing that goes on inside a, a computer, so you've got an ALU, you've got registers, you've got instruction decoder, and you've got the uh, other bits, of, uh, bits and pieces associated with sending the signals to the, through the ALU and putting the results in registers. Now, the 32-bit ALU, of course, is a tiny part of this, in 1985-86 this was a chip full by 1991 we started to get the idea that it could be used as a part of a chip full so even though that's 50,000 gates or 200,000 transistors that still is only small in comparison to the to the capacity of a 1 micron CMOS process which is what it was aimed at so this chip here has the whole ARM 7 core in it and a whole bunch of other stuff outside it. And the attraction that was being offered at this point was the customer who was going to put the other stuff around the outside of the core needn't have to worry about the computer. He could buy that from ARM, he could put it on his silicon, he knew it was going to work, he can focus on the outside part of it. He also doesn't have to worry about the software de development environment because that's something which is very closely associated with the computer core and that was something that ARM was including in the package. So they could do software development for driving the inputs or for collecting the outputs and processing them. So in the 20 years since 1970, the 4-bit ALU has become a tiny part of a 32-bit RISC processor, which in turn has become a small part of a typical chip. This is the pace, the real observable pace of the development of silicon technology, the evolution of silicon technology. Now, I have this diagram which I love. It comes from a 1999 book and I'll, uh, uh, I'll explain why as we go along. But the main thing I'm looking at at this point is the blue line. This is Moore's law, extrapolated from about 1981 and more or less up to date. In fact, I will make it up to date by just extending it a little bit. It doesn't make that much of a difference. And there's ARM with its million transistor IC about 1991, which is consistent. What it also shows, though, is between now, between 1991 and now, we are able to get trans, uh, integrated circuits today, memory chips, with 20 billion transistors on them, 20,000 million transistors on them, for a price which is around 5 euros, 5 dollars, 5 pounds. Um, it's not expensive, and it's hugely more, huge more capacity between when ARM started and today. Now ARM is only just down the road as far as time is concerned. It's been in existence for 25 years. Yeah, last year was its anniversary. And in those 25 years, integrated circuits have grown in capacity by 20,000 times. So there are 20,000 times more transistors on the typical circuit today than there was when ARM started. And they're faster. That's 10 times faster, broadly speaking. Now, if you've got one gate and it's going at 10 times the speed, 
then you can actually do 10 times as much with it. So it's, we're looking at a design capacity inside this typical piece of silicon, which is 200,000 times more than it was when ARM started. Now that should tell you something. Uh, apart from anything else, it tells you that you certainly don't use the same approach for building something which is 200,000 times more complex than you did on the, on the simpler instance. It's a bit like the difference between building a garden shed and building a village. So it's a, a lot of additional capacity and complexity comes in. And so you need different methods. And the methods, of course, are something which tends to be invisible at this point. So by 2012, Moore's law has taken us to 45, mil, 45 nanometer transistors. And here is a production device. It's the NVIDIA Tegra 3, which is broadly the same as the Apple A4 chip, which was the control chip in the iPhone 1. Um, it's got five CPUs in it, plus other smaller controls in it. And the reason why this is a popular photograph, of course, is it's a die shot which includes ARM chips. Um, what it doesn't tend to show, though, is as you zoom down, even with a respectable visual microscope, that's about as much detail as you can see. When you go with an electron microscope, then you can see something like this. If you strip back the oxide layers, then the, the uh, visible lines are the conductors. And what we're saying is, where's the transistors? Well, the transistors are there, three of them. So there's a billion minus three transistors somewhere else around this, and, okay? And a design involves connecting them all up. And so one thing that we've seriously underestimated is there is an additional huge level of complexity caused by the connectivity. So it's not just complexity as in an obstacle, it's complexity as an opportunity. So you're not just connecting three transistors, three transistors together, which have got a limited number of ways that you can connect them together. You're talking about a billion transistors which can be connected together in a hugely more elaborate and complex way, determined by the architecture, of course. But again, that amounts to another 100 times functionality increase in that same capacity of silicon. Now, methods have changed a lot. And uh, IC design was moved from that pen and paper uh, first off model via high level description languages and synthesis but we're still talking about additional complexity which comes around when you design these things the methods have evolved the methods have changed but they've changed year upon year over those times they've evolved new things new features improved tools but also very brand new tools now that advance in Moore's law hasn't just happened by factories making things smaller. Um, a, a physical electronic process, an integrated circuit, is a mechanical thing. It is, it's all to do with manipulating real materials, real silicon, real metals, deposition and patterning, photolithography, its chemistry and its optics, and all together to create, to create feature sizes which are as small as they are today, has needed continuous improvement and reinvention of the component parts of the chemistry which is necessary to produce those integrated circuits. Now, the example at the bottom here is a, is, is a particularly good one because it links to the next page, but I'll say that in a moment. But here, look, this is a cross-section cross of a typical integrated circuit. Ten layers of metal are sitting on top of this very bottom layer, which is where the transistors lie. You know, there's a lot of additional process complexity put into that. Over here you've got the planar transistor, very, very familiar to the original Herney one, but there is a move towards making the transistors uh, vertical, so-called FinFETs, or 2.5D implementations, simply because it's so difficult to make things that are flat and as small as they are and make them work. But this fella in the middle is a deep extreme UV stepper. It's a product which is, going, which is going to be necessary to make the physically smallest integrated circuits. And it's going to have a price tag of a hundred million dollars just for one of them. It's pretty exotic and you can see the little bit there of the light path through it. 
the, the wavelength is so short, short you can't use transparent lenses, you have to use mirrors. And so the uh, optics are optics of mirrors. Now, we've already been doing some pretty amazing stuff here. But since the beginning of time, all the way up to around 1990, deep blue light was enough for doing the uh, uh, was good enough for doing the photolithography, and the mercury vapor lamp was the lamp that did it. Back in 1990, very fortunately, because the geometries of processes were hitting wavelength, back in 1990, the Exima laser was discovered, which gave us a new light source, 193 nanometers. <laughs> From around 2000, the processes have had feature sizes which are smaller than the wavelength of the light which is being used to put them on the silicon, which effectively makes it very, very difficult to do. And there's all sorts of tricks which have had to come in, immersion lithography, dual tone resist, multiple masking. Uh, these are masks which are now costing over a million pounds a mask, and you might need Ten masks for the metal, three, four masks at the bottom for the physical processing, four, five masks. You're looking at around 20 million pounds just for the, just for the masks of a process that you're going to implement. You've got to have a big market to justify something like that. The extreme UV is still tomorrow's technology. It's not there yet. So at a, even at 100 million pounds each, they can't quite make it. And there is some doubts that they're going to be able to make it in time because there are fundamentals that we're approaching here. The size of the silicon atom and the size of the silicon crystal is getting to be the sort of size of the transistors themselves. So, in 70 years, a lot of things have changed, but the atom hasn't. The atom of silicon is still the same as it was. The atom of the implementation process is still the same. And there's a growing opinion that 10, 10 nanometers or 7 nanometers might very well be the smallest yieldable node ever. And to put some scale on that, I know for a fact that uh, there are 10 nanometer uh, devices being prototyped right now. So they, they are being prototyped, the mask sets are there, the gate libraries are there, but the, uh, the option about whether it's going to be yieldable, uh, whether it's going to be producible, we really just don't know. But the chances are that if 10 turns out to be producible, then 7 won't. So it's getting seriously difficult. The Denard scaling, which was the thing which has been a major feature of all of electronics, pretty well microelectronics, since it started back in the 60s, Denard scaling has meant that every process generation, the implementation got smaller, which made, meant that effectively the cost got less because it's the square area of silicon that relates to cost. The speed got faster because the nodes got smaller, the capacitance got less and therefore they went faster. And the power dissipation went down because the, the nodes are faster, the nodes are less capacitance, then the power dissipation of a, of a particular implementation goes down. That stopped about 10 years ago, phased out gently, but now it's gone. At this stage, the only thing that you get out of scaling is smaller die. Frequently, the performance is worse, the power dissipation is worse, and the cost is higher because the yield is worse. So it's difficult to make these nanometer scale transistors and the interconnect. The sharply increase in the process uh, complexity and cost. The first silicon processes had four elements from the element from the. Uh, um, the table of elements. The current ones have 14. So there's a lot of effort goes into the chemistry to make the small, small transistors producible. To make them survive the 80 million volts per meter, which is the voltage which is applied across a small transistor when you scale it up. Um, this reduces yield and reliability, it is changing the design and the photolithography methods. You can't use the same design methods when you're not sure whether the transistor is going to be there or not, whether it's going to wear out or not. And the statistical nature of the atoms is showing through. So here we are, that diagram is broadly speaking correct. At, a hun at 130 nanometers you could look at the bulk characteristics of silicon. By 90 nanometers the actual impurity atoms were starting to make an appearance. 
by 28 nanometers you can count the number of atoms in a channel in a transistor and the impurities well there may be one in a channel or there may be one nearby and the effect of that is a, a effect on the electrical characteristics certainly by 14 nanometers we're not pretending that the material is bulk property anymore it's the material it's the properties of the atom and around seven nanometers we really don't know it's unknown territory but that variability that you now see means that I mean an atom is a statistical device it's not a neat bore atom anymore it is a uh, uh, it is a probabilistic it's a wave atom and that means that you can't be sure of anything anymore you can't be sure that you've got a carrier in the channel you can't be sure how many atoms are in the channel because they may not be in the channel or they may be if you measure them uh, so this it again significantly increases the design challenge it is very sure therefore that the end of Moore's law as a way of shrinking transistors to make integrated circuits smaller is definitely in sight and it's not many very many years away but my controversial question is does it matter and we've spent the last 50 odd years designing integrated circuits and making use of the fact that we can scale them and we've we've benefited from that in all kinds of ways in the sophistication of the technology products which are all around us if Moore's law ceases will all of that development cease as well as <coughs> well excuse me that's my real question so back in 1947 around the time the transistor was invented this was a computer it's called baby it was built in the University of Manchester and it's the first the recognized first general purpose stored program computer and of course we know what computers have done since then I mean this was a very early one and you can see there was an awful lot of valves in that and valves are fairly unreliable and so one of the things they had to do on a very regular basis was change the valves and mend it before you could use it and they wanted something which was better than that and the transistor came in being much more reliable and so it became the technology driver and the uh, the the computer and I suppose being the first stop program computer this was also the first supercomputer it's the only one that there was then this this has become the driving technology the driver of technology and has been for some time so of course a modern supercomputer looks a different beast altogether but they have to ask the question is high performance still high performance computing still the thing which is driving technology today um, surely this must the professional electronic systems whether military financial applications the requirement for the highest performance inside the box it stretches the envelope yes but surely then this must always be the technology driver well the answer, answer, answer interestingly enough is no this isn't driving it these days because the market value isn't enough these things sell for hundreds of millions of pounds a time but they don't sell very many that's the thing which is driving technology today it's all the stuff that you have the stuff that you're pointing at me at the moment this is the this the stuff which consumers are using and they're taking it in large volumes and that's where the market is but the thing about this is these users are not buying it for the technology they're buying it for the functionality they're buying they don't care whether there's two micron two nanometers CMOS by CMOS 3.5 in there they don't care they don't care which part of it is done in electronics and which part of it is embedded software they don't care it doesn't matter to them what matters is it's the right shape and it appeals to them it's got the right functionality because it's competitive and that it's affordable and of course we're all consumers of this stuff in our day jobs in our lives rather our day jobs may be the technology but our lives are where we consume the electronics itself now it's not really um, uh, a surprise to find we still have the mainframe computer it's still out here and we still have the minis and the personal computers and the desktops and the thing which is the big promise of the next few years is the internet of things this these are huge huge volumes of integrated circuits and software and capabilities which are going to be put together and used in ways that we find difficult to imagine today uh, the thing we know about it is each one of these waves 
gives around 10 times the economic value of the previous wave. So the other waves will still exist, but the technologies that the other waves will use, so like the mainframe computers are still going to be there, but the only technologies which are affordable are the ones which are going to be justified by the market leaders. And so the professionals and the professional use, users have to inherit the technology from the commercial market. And it's now interesting to see that ARM, the little processor which was originally designed to power smartphone one, um, is actually going to be the, uh, the processor of choice in the very latest K computer from uh, Fujitsu, which is going to be the world's highest performance, high performance machine. So it's possible. This is a commercial design, a commercial architecture being applied to even the highest performance uh, applications. So let's look for a moment then at what the consumer thinks of when they think of technology products. This is an iPhone and it says on the back designed in, by Apple in California and assembled in China. And as far as the world is concerned, as far as the consumer is concerned, that's the end of the story. There's this thing called design and that's done in America and it's history. And then there's this thing called manufacture and that's done in China and we're no good at manufacturing in the UK so that's history. And if you, if you want to look for something really good, then you can reward the guy that designed it. Now this guy is Jonathan Ive, he came from the UK, and uh, he was raised in Chingford, and has been the brains behind many of Apple's products. So let's make him a knight. You know, he's going to get knighted for doing this design. The design that he did was the outside of the case. He styled the iPhone, he styled the icons, and he had some, something to do with the human interface. He didn't go inside the box at all. We know that actually design happens at many levels inside a product, but we probably don't know how many levels. If you start to take apart the iPhone, then you take out the battery, and I haven't mentioned the battery. The battery in itself, lithium-ion flat battery, was a major breakthrough and is still evolving at a phenomenal rate. Um, but if you take the battery aside and you look at, look at the vibration motor. This is a motor which is designed for this phone. It's so small that it can only be assembled by robots. It automated assembly is the only way to put, it, put this thing together. It's a technical achievement in its own right. Look at the camera. 8 by 5, sorry, 8 by 8 by 5 millimeters, this particular one. It's not as small as they make them together. It's got an autofocus lens and it's a still camera and it's a video camera. And they're still evolving that. That, that product will be used in several designs, but at the same time, it will be redesigned for the next Apple smartphone or for the next, Sam, next Samsung Galaxy. These are technical achievements which we tend to gloss over on our way to the chip, which we tend to think of as the only thing which is in there. Moving down, we find the control board, which is the equivalent to the motherboard on a PC. And uh, one side of it looks like that. And the first, first thing you can see is there's a lot of stuff in there, actually. Typically, 20 integrated circuits inside something like a smartphone. Uh, those integrated circuits, an awful lot of them will have been designed for or customized for this specific application. And look at the technologies. Non-volatile MOS, bi-CMOS, MEMS for the, mi the micro machines, analog CMOS, surface acoustic waves. Also all of these other invisible components, operating systems, drivers, stacks, applications, GSM, all of those things don't show on that circuit board. You can look as close as you like with the biggest microscope, but you won't see an awful lot of the components which have gone into there. And of course, that's only one side. The board has got two sides. A bit of a challenge in itself to make a board which has got six layers in it and actually stick components to both sides of it so that one side doesn't fall off when you're attaching them on the other side. That's a bit of a challenge for somebody. More processors more processes and of course Apple um, and ARM and Samsung got into making this which is the A4 processor which I referred to a little earlier. This is the processor where if you like the core of ARM's biggest processors go. It's the complexity of the biggest digital part of the circuit. It's the control processor for what essentially is the center of the smartphone. 
But let's look inside that then. Well, immediately we look inside that. That's a cross section of the package, which is just 1.4 millimeters thick. It's actually got three die in it. There's the processor sock and there's two memory die on top of each other. Quite an achievement there. There's four layers of interconnect in the, in the middle as well, which it says four layers platform package. That package technology is not something which has just fallen off a tree either. Somebody has had to work on the de design and development of that and to make something like this producible in an economic way. And it's made for Apple in this, in this case, but it would be equally made for somebody else. So by the time we've got to the technology, which is kind of familiar to us, the digital technology which is inside the A4 uh, chip, then we start to realize that perhaps the transistors are an important part of a product, a very important part of an electronic system product. It wouldn't work without it. But there's lots of other stuff in there that your smartphone wouldn't work without as well. And I think that, the, that it's become apparent that the most important technology that you have in your product is the one that you don't have. It's the one that you thought you had, or the one that your competitor has that you haven't got. And it's the fact that you've been able to in, in, include it in your product and therefore differentiate your product from the competitor is what's made it a very, ex uh, excessive, ex a very successful product. And I don't want to forget these virtual components because there are a lot more. Um, we, we look at the metal work, metal handling, look at the plastics handling, glasses, the displays, the transducers. There's a lot of technologies which go into here, most of which people tend to assume have already been invented and therefore stay still. The other thing which has become apparent is that manufacturing process itself has become part of these phones. You couldn't make a smartphone without the robot processes. To be involved, therefore, in the development of sophisticated manufacturing processes is just as much an important part of making an iPhone possible as making the chip which is in the iPhone or actually doing the final assembly of the iPhone. Now, the only parts that appear on a list, the bill of materials, which is a classic part of a, a product like this, are the physical things, the things that you can pick up, the things that will will be put into the system but it's the virtual components of which there are now many which are a significant factor in the production of anything real but unfortunately out of sight means out of mind so we all need to do our little bits to make sure that the virtual components of which we are most likely to be involved incidentally in our working careers are aware people are aware of what they what they are and how they work now, it also should become clear by now that a product is a commercial opportunity. A successful product is one that you can sell to customers in sufficient volumes that you can recover the cost of developing it. And the cost of developing it includes the cost of researching the technologies which are going to go into it. So a failed product makes no money. It doesn't flow back down the food chain and that doesn't flow back down to the research communities either. So successful products fund the whole lot. It's got to work. You don't get an additional pat on the back if it works. You get, a, you get the rug pulled out from under you if it doesn't. So it's got to work. That's the assumed part of it. It's got to be economical. It's got to cost less to make than, it does to, than you can sell it for, essentially. It's got to be reproducible. If you need to produce a million of these things, but they only, each one of them requires somebody to put something in by hand, then that's, it's not producible. It has to be innovative. It has to put the technologies which are available together in a way which is, which is unique, or at least has value to an end customer. Now, this is quite an achievement because one of the things that developer, developers are doing is predicting the future. Now, generally speaking, when you go to a fair, there may be somebody there who tells your fortune and they gaze into a crystal ball, and you don't really believe them. Now, for some reason, engineering and science, we are able to predict the future. We are able to do it with a degree of certainty that has become commonplace. We now are expected to predict the future and live up to it. That's part of your job, but the good news is it's because it's based on hard science. So it's understanding the fundamentals of the science that we're using, understanding the limits of the 
of the models of that science uh, and applying them sensibly is what makes a designer's job so challenging but also so interesting. And the designer has to base designs on technology which is available, not technology which is promised or technology which could have a wonderful opportunity someday, it just doesn't happen to be now. Business is out of business if it fails to deliver its, uh, its next um, promised product. So how do we use a few billion transistors? Okay, this is a 19 nanometer sand disk, 128 gigabyte flash memory containing at least 60 billion transistors. How do you start to design something like that? 60,000 million transistors. Well, one of the things coming back to my graph that didn't uh, highlight was the red line. The red line was productivity. Now the problem with an exponent graph is the gaps between the two lines is also an exponent which means the productivity about the time when ARM started was around 100 person years. It was possible for us to produce a chip in around 100 person years of effort and so we did. But if you look, at, roll that time forward then it's just not possible to produce to, to establish a business where it's going to take eight and a half thousand man years to produce a chip even back in 2005. And of course verification had become a problem as well in the meantime. These, these chips were getting so complex because of the ways that you could connect all the transistors together that we were not anticipating uh, productivity as simply producing a chip but it also had to verify that it is what it was originally designed to. Now none of that actually happened as a problem and principally it happened because the, the exercise of design changed from being single designers to small teams to local teams to global teams to global teams. The internet, the standardization of the PC, the ability to communicate and share design challenges across the, across the world happened during this period of time. And that meant that the design team could be bigger than just the design team that was assembled in one office. It also meant that reuse became viable as well and in the same time when I first took the ARM license with my previous company we tried to get reuse working but we didn't have any structures for reusing designs. All designs were new and it caused a lot of difficulties just establishing naming conventions so we could pass uh, designs from one generation to the next. So we're now in the heavily expertise, expertise reuse domain and as a result of which that productivity gap has actually gone down. We can now produce a system, a whole smartphone with less than a hundred person years of effort and that's quite an achievement. Without 90%, greater than 90% reuse today, the electronic systems would not be producible. So it's very difficult for somebody to move into this market from new because they haven't got the history, they haven't got the established design. So me methodology has become the product, designer productivity has become the methodology driver. Um, to utilize the possibilities offered by those billions of transistors. It's hardware, software, but it's other technologies and methods and tools. It's in company, but it's also from other companies. Buying solutions for complex parts of the design have become a, pro become a reality, whereas they once, once upon a time would have been a serious problem. Reuse improves quality, but it also makes design more difficult. You have to make things such a way that they can be reused which means they have to avoid as much as possible bugs. But it does mean that clean sheet approaches are always going to be hugely more expensive. More expensive than even governments can afford. So the high, the high performance machines, the navigating systems for space stuff and so on, they can't afford the real cost of doing this anymore so they have to use commercial processes as well. So, it's reuse for productivity throughout the system. All technologies manufacture. ARM provides a productive technologies for embedding intelligent. That's all it does. And it does it in the, not just in the processor chip, but in all of the chips around inside this, the, your average smartphone. So ARM is not there. It's getting, the, it's getting the power and performance inside that box by distributing the processors. So you don't just have one processor in the middle. You have lots of them. 
and the processes themselves can be simple things or can be more, exp uh, more elaborate things aimed at the market. There are 24 processes in the ARMS portfolio because of the range of applications that they might be used in. <coughs> and you also have to look at the architecture. How do you put these things together in a way to make use of that power? And look at those quad core implementations there. And the graphics core over here doesn't really show it in quite the same way. But it was realized about 10 years ago that you couldn't just make a bigger and bigger single processor and connect everything to it. The way to achieve the power was to have lots of processes and that needed architecture and architecture again is something which was separated from the implementation process. Libraries, drivers, partnerships, all of those things are part of making something work and were part of the essentially the iceberg below the tip that normally people associate with ARM. How successful was it? How successful is it? Well, back in 2014, when it was last publishing figures, ARM shipped 12 billion CPUs. 12 billion. There's only 7 billion people on the planet, and ARM shipped more than two to everybody. ARM don't make anything. It's a virtual business. Um, it's selling solutions, intellectual property. And it made over a billion dollars a year in its final years before it was acquired by SoftBank recently for 24 billion pounds. Now a company which is only 4,000 people big worldwide at that time and doesn't have a factory anywhere to have a value of 24 billion pounds that somebody was prepared to actually put that money on the table to buy it means it's a very real business and yet it's a business which uh, as we've said before governments have difficulty identifying with. So the market's insatiable appetite for new, better and cheaper Everybody, that is you, wants to have better products next year. But the, you only want to have better products. The market doesn't mandate that that comes from smaller transistors. Since 100 nanometers, shrinking transistors has got slower, more intricate and more expensive. And yet, customer expectations have still continued to be met. So in other words, Moore's law has already been slowing down for the last 10 years and you haven't noticed it. It means that the slowing of Moore's law for silicon hasn't meant this, the end of system shrinking. And in the 21st century it's clear that Moore's law is actually about functional density, not about transistor density. So its, it's delivery is not inextricably bound to the size of transistors. So my last slide, conclusions. 70 years of transistor has transformed our lives, we mustn't underestimate that. We've become used to it, but that doesn't mean to say that it is going to continue to develop unabated for the next. So the classic Moore's Law, the end really is in, in, in sight. But while we expect the capacity of silicon to deliver this, the products are maintaining expectations and the wider scope by designing to a wider scope. So architect systems, designers are designing systems and architecting systems these days. The transistor is still vital part of this, but it's an alloy of technologies now, which is what the end product is, and it's the end product functionality that people need. I, my, conclusion, my concluding remark here is that Moore's law probably was always a statement of doubling system functionality every 18 to 24 months and in that context it's not changed. So thank you for listening and good luck with the next 50 years of Moore's law.